Hello and welcome to the Keto Man's Club podcast. We're glad you're here, where each week we talk about men's health and lifestyle. We do so with the foundation of the ketogenic diet and lifestyle. If you don't know what keto is, stick around and you'll find out. The podcast will bring you real honest fun. Each week we strive to uncover the tips and tricks that you can use in your everyday life to maximize your overall health and find the clearest path to becoming the best version of yourself that you were meant to be. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Keto Man's Club podcast. My name is Chris. I'm one of your hosts. And as always, I'm joined by Jim and Alberto. How's it going, Jim? Uh, it's good, sir. Uh, Fourth of July had just uh, passed and um, all the illegal fireworks across the country were shot off in the air. So congratulations to everybody. And we survived and all is good, man. How are you? Tired, but that's no different than normal. Um, just lots and lots of stuff to do and only so many hours in the day. Uh, but that's just the way things are. So, um, Alberto, mm -hmm. what's new with you? Uh, speaking of 4th of July, it was kind of cool. Our our neighborhood out here actually did still have a 4th of July fireworks thing. It was uh, kind of like a drive-in, stay-in-your-car type deal. But uh, we threw the kids in the back of the truck, uh, parked the truck, and got to watch a fireworks show almost as if everything was normal. Hmm. So that was nice. Yes. And it was in my new truck because I got a newer truck. I also got a newer grill. I saw my first murder hornet, and I've been painting for the last two days, so I am extremely tired, dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a rough couple of days, man. <laughs> I can, yeah, uh, a lot of stuff going on, um, as is normal in life, um, but it, it, it doesn't, um, doesn't change that it's still a lot. Uh, yeah. Well, um, yeah, the, seeing the murder hornet, I saw the picture of that and that was, uh, exciting. Um, and, uh, yeah. the new truck, I mean, there was nothing to, nice. to give it scale mm -hmm. for the size of that hornet. So I, I, you know, wasn't trying to get any close to it than I had to, but it was every bit of two inches long and about as fat as a Sharpie. So that, that guy, oh my. he was big. Yeah, he was big and he was not happy. Exactly. He was at the shop I went to this morning. I went to go open the door. And it was like right in front of my face because it was just banging against the glass trying to get out. And, I, and it kind of freaked me out. But, you know, I was very carefully able to open the door, you know, the big service door. And he bounced around for a while, like literally peed all over the place <laughs> and then took off. And I was just like, wow. And like 49% of me wanted to kill it. And 51% of me was afraid of retaliation if I failed. <laughs> so uh -huh. so we, we let him go on his merry way. <laughs> Murder hornets as bouncers for a club. That could be a whole new career path for somebody. If you could train those yeah. guys. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, no joke. I mean, it was probably the size of one of the small big lighters. For, for any kind of frame of reference. It, it was, uh, oh, yeah, yeah it, it was, a, it was a sight to see, but I mean, it just looked like a big giant bee. And I'm like, I'm look, looking around, there's nobody around. And I'm like, am I the only person standing here staring at this thing? Like <laughs> I should at least get a picture. Like I, I don't, I mean, I'm not putting anything up there for scale. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, let, let's do our shout outs real quick. And then, um, then we'll dig into our guest story. I, I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating. I, I, I've seen some of the results that are that Khalil has shared, um, but I I honestly know very little about him, and I'm excited to learn more. So uh, stick around for that if you're listening. Uh, but before that, let's do our um, let's do our shout outs real quick. Jim, do you want to start? Yes. So every Tuesday in the Keto Man's Club and the newly renamed the Keto 101 Man's Club, we do a, a Transformation Tuesday post and encourage all the guys to share their updated photos and whatnot. And uh, my shout out is to Mark Bronson uh, from Conway, South Carolina, who had his uh, before photo at starting weight 275. He's down to 218 with a goal weight of 200. Uh, totally different look for the guy. So congratulations to Mark Bronson. Yeah, very cool. And Alberto? Going kind of the other direction this week, I have an anti shout out, oh. which means oh. uh, I've been off Facebook um, pretty much for like the last five days. Like I just needed a a decompression, so to speak. So I just, I mean, I'm, I, the account is obviously still active, but I deleted the app and I refuse to get on it. And maybe like you know, once a day, I'll actually reinstall the app, open it up, rifle through some notifications, then uh, 
scroll until I see something that I don't want to see, and then I'll delete the app again, and then I won't go back for 48 hours. And it's <laughs> it's it's been quite freeing, and uh, just just needed to, to to step away for a minute and just kind of reevaluate uh-huh. things. I was, get, I was I was getting caught up in all the wrong conversations mm-hmm. about current events, and it was it, nothing productive was coming of it because when you argue on Facebook, nothing productive comes of anything. So I was like, you know what, we need to we need to take a step back and and reevaluate yeah. <laughs> a few things here. So it, it's been good. So. A lot of yep. good things out there happening. I'm sure I've been kind of unplugged, which I would highly recommend everyone does every now and then. Um, so yeah, no no actual shout out, but mm-hmm. everybody that's out there rocking, keep rocking. Yeah, I'm I'm resistant to it because I probably do have a level of uh, dependence on it, but I absolutely need to go on a social media fast of some sort. Uh, it's not helping my mental state at all right now. Um, but that's a whole other thing, and I'm not going <laughs> to go there right now. So, um, so I am. My shout out goes to one of our mem- members uh, who just asked a really good question. Now he's he is rocking it. His name is his, his name on the Facebook group is Matthew Davis. He sh- he posted a question uh, stating, "I think a lot of us have been asked this at one point in uh, pa- one point or another, and I wanted to see how you respond without." Without being a smart ass or without puking up four <laughs> oh, volumes can't, of information. Can't do that, then. Uh, <laughs> yep. um, so the question that that he's he's posing that that I know that I've heard a million times at this point is: Do you have any tips or suggestions for starting keto? And I think it's a really great question because it sparked, and this was in the main group, so this wasn't. This wasn't geared or, or angled or, or uh, towards our, our our Keto 101 members. This was geared towards our, our veterans. And um, we got some really good interaction on that post. I've, I, I would, I'm would i not going to read all the, the responses. They're, they're just a lot of really good ones. Um, and a, a lot of really good bi-directional conversation on what different people have done um, and, and things like that. Let's air on the side of short and sweet, but Alberto, give your, your, what you would answer. I'll give mine, Jim, you can give yours. And, and, and that will be kind of our topic of the week. Yeah. And I, I believe I, I actually responded on this. And I just, you know, I, I, if I remember correctly, I just kept it very, very simple. And I was like, well, I, I read all your ingredients, uh, no sugar, no grains. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. Uh, stop buying food and start buying ingredients to make food. And I believe I also threw the caveat in there that that won't land you specifically keto, but you will get a lot of mileage out of that advice. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's pretty much exactly what you wrote. I just found it. And yeah, I, I agree. I, that will at least get you in the eating real food world, uh, which is a far cry better than the uh, the average thing. My uh, my answer was that I direct them to dietdoctor.com, uh, which has some a really great, simple explanation of what keto is and the, the resource that my wife and I used a lot, just a ton, was their visual food guides. They have these graphics that show all the different vegetables and everything and show them on a scale of most carby to least carby. And it just made it very simple without having to look at a list of text of, you know, this and this and this and this, or even saying what we can and can't eat. It just said, here's where it stands. And that, I think, is a very, very useful resource. Uh, The other thing that I mentioned was that uh, when I was doing my early research, I found the Fathead movie. It's available for purchase on YouTube. Go purchase it. Support that uh, the 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 creators of that. They also have a fat fat head kids version uh, that explains all of this to uh, to kids as well. But it's just a very engaging, very well put together uh, hour and thirty minute presentation movie type thing. Um, a lot of it is animated, but it explains in in very good but easy to understand detail what. Um, what a ketogenic state is, how to get there, all of that. And so that's the other resource that I, I, if I'm looking for something quick, that's something that I would gladly give out as a good, here's where you'd find more. Uh, Jim, how about you? Um, Probably echo what you guys have shared, but I would also say 
um, that portion control is a key part of uh, keto, meaning that if you are thinking that it is just eat meat and eggs and some green vegetables all the time, whatever you want, throw cheese in, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the basic idea, but it doesn't mean that you can gorge yourself on all of those foods as well. And the fact that you, um, if you're one of those, it, well, you can't gorge yourself on those foods. The other thing that I would add is that if talking to somebody who, and asking them, what have you done in the past? And if they rattle off like five or seven or 23 different diet plans, ways of eating, et cetera, before I'd go down the keto road, I'm like, I would ask, why, why did they not work for you? Because a lot of people have the trouble of getting into the mindset that this is a new way of eating. And so they think, oh, I'm going to diet. I'm going to lose 40 pounds. I'm going to be in swimsuit mode for the summer. And then I'm going to go back to fast food three times a week and French fries and all that. And like, that's not how this, it can work somewhat that way, mm -hmm. but you're not going to get the long-term effect that you're wanting. So, you know, understanding that you, so my point of that part of the conversation is, you may have to ease into it a little bit. Don't be that person who says, I'm starting keto on Monday, and they throw everything out of their pantry that they've got, and it's just steak, eggs, and cheese. And then four days down the line, you're like, I can't do this, and I run to McDonald's. You, you're, you got to get in the mindset. You don't want to beat yourself up when you struggle. You got to find support systems. So... I've, I've spoke too much. That's what I would <laughs> you spoke just enough. Yeah, that wasn't quite <laughs> four volumes. That was three volumes, but that, that wasn't yeah. quite four volumes. And and I why guess. can't I gorge? I want to gorge. <laughs> you know, that's fine if you want to gorge. There's stuff out there that you can that you can do that on. But the other thing is, you don't have to do that. That is your mind telling yeah. you that you need to do that. That your mind is saying, you've been feeding me every three hours for the last... 25 years or whatever the case is. And now you don't need that. You got all this stuff around your middle that can serve as fuel for your body. So let your body adjust. Yeah, you're going to have keto flu. Probably you're going to have the keto headache and everything. It's, it's okay. Don't beat yourself up on day four and say, I can't do this. I'm, it's over and done. No, give it a little bit of time. I totally understand. Volume five and six. Yeah, yeah volume. <laughs> there, there we go. There we go. No, I, no. I think that you're absolutely right. I was just mainly giving you a hard time. And and there are yeah. those people that want to know. They they say, but I thought I could just eat all the bacon in the world. And at first, whenever I'm giving, it, it, I think this is important to to know and to hear. Whenever I hear someone that wants to become or begin eating keto. I won't tell them anything about portion or calories or anything, and I won't tell them flat out that, that calories don't matter, but I, I will tell them just focus on eating the right things. Eat as much as you need to, especially in that adaptation phase, because it's important that you just eat the right things. Eventually, you're going to probably need to start dialing that in, start working on trying to figure out uh, exactly how much you need to eat in truth. Your body will start telling you as you adapt how much you need and you'll naturally start to eat less. And so um, you know, listen to your body. And that's the, the other side of this that a lot of us say pretty, pretty naturally once we've been ketogenic for a while is only eat when you're hungry. I had uh, – it was yesterday. I think the only thing that I ate of substance – like I'm having a hard time thinking of anything else that I had eaten was about three quarter pound of 72, 27 ground beef. Um, that was all I was hungry for, for the entire day. Um, and that just was kind of my day. And, and there's extraneous factors that are probably contributing to that, but I listened to my body. I didn't go, I didn't force myself to eat because I hadn't eaten all my calories or anything like that. Um, because there's been other days that I totally over ate and, um, I'm, I'm, I think Alberto is one of those as well, that calories at the end of the month or at the end of the week is a better indication than a day to day. Oh, absolutely. And, and since we're just talking about calories and <clears throat> as someone who has successfully and purposefully gained weight eating keto, 
it is entirely possible to, yeah. to eat too much and gain weight. Because, and, and like I said, I've done it. I did it successfully, and I did it on purpose. It took an extremely uncomfortable amount of eating over a very long time, mm -hmm. but it is possible. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, uh, yeah, it, that, that's, that's way more, but that, that really gives a, a really solid base for the sample of answers that, that if you are a veteran that you can give those who are just getting started. Uh, but also it, it really gives the, um, it, it gives some, some of those that might just be starting or might be curious, which we're getting more and more of those every day. How many people did we add to one one this week? Uh, 19, 19. That's not bad. Uh, not bad at all. So, um, we're, we're seeing more and more of those that are just getting started applying to get into the groups more and more. Um, at least in our groups, uh, more and more men are, are, are applying to join. And, uh, a lot of them are saying, I'm curious, I'm just getting started, things like that. So, uh, having that, that bit of information to be able to get started is very, very helpful. Um, okay. Well, we have rambled plenty long at this point, and our guest has patiently waited in the wings. Khalil, how are you today? I am absolutely fantastic. How are y'all? Doing very well. We're um, good. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, just it, like I said before, I, I, you know, we've seen you on Facebook. You've interacted pretty well with the group, and and you've you've contributed quite uh, quite a lot. Uh, but I still don't feel like I know you very well, and I want to fix that. So, start us out by telling us a little bit more about who you are, where you are in the world, um, what you do, you know, professionally, or or any of that type of stuff, and maybe a little bit about your upbringing. But let's let's hold the health stuff until in, until follow up. Sure. So my name is Khalil Islam's work. I currently live just outside of Spokane, Washington, up in the Pacific Northwest, or we call this area the Inland Northwest. Um, I grew up in Tacoma, which is about four and a half hours west of here. And I moved to, I'm on the edge of old, I, I like to say I'm 48. And I moved here when I was about 20 not long before my 21st birthday to finish an undergraduate degree. I thought I'd be here for three or four years and then I'd go back home and find a career and stay in the I-5 corridor somewhere in the 253 or 206 area code. And that never happened. So I've been here since in the Spokane area since 92. Um, I finished college and I was working at the time with homeless and runaway kids and families of at-risk kids and I stumbled into a job working at a university. I started at Eastern Washington University, where I completed my undergrad as their advisor for student organizations, fraternities, and sororities. And I did higher ed administration for about seven years or so. And then I decided I've gone about a, as high up the food chain as, as I think I want to, want to go in this field. And what I also realized is the further I went up the food chain, the less I enjoyed the bureaucratic aspects of the job. I got to interface and interact less with students and was more into bureaucracy, especially in my last position where I was the conduct officer. So like Think of the high school uh, vice principal for discipline. I was that mm -hmm. for a college campus. So went back to school and got into teaching. And I taught at Eastern for a while and then and taught uh, at Spokane Falls Community College and then landed a full-time instructional position at Spokane Falls where I've been, I guess I've been three years or this will be my fourth year full-time depending on what happens with this COVID stuff. Um, I'm married, been married for pushing 20 years. Uh, we have two wonderful daughters, uh, 15 and 12 that are, you know, I, most of the time they're my joy and sometimes they're, they'll be the death of me, but they're really, <laughs> really great kids. Um, let's see. I'm trying to trying to think most of the stuff that I've been kind of like brainstorming and writing notes on is all like health related stuff <laughs> but uh, beyond doing you know food stuff um one of the other pieces I think one of the things that I've loved about the group the keto men's club is how just how collegial everybody is and it is probably probably I'd ha I'd have to say I was going to say one of the but I I'd say this is the most civil group 
on Facebook I think I've ever been a part of. And I say that as a I'm a part of the administration team for a bunch of dads. <laughs> and a couple of, I know uh, Alberto's on a bunch of dads. Um, and I think I, I, I noticed him from this group on, we have a main group that has like over 120,000 members. And then we have these subgroups. And the group that I noticed Alberto in was the fitness group. After I no, joined this, I was like, "Oh, you're no way. you're here too." <laughs> yeah. yeah, imagine that, right? Imagine my surprise. <laughs> but it was like, "Oh, there's overlap. That's a good thing." So now, anytime I encounter a dude in our fitness group or in the main group that's asking about keto uh, before the the well poisoners arrive, I say, "Hey, it, once you get your bearings, there's this group over here, and now there's this beginners group, and you should check them out before the haters come on and try to discourage you from doing keto." As, as, as much as they can try. You're the uh, one but, that keeps sending people from the dad's group. That's where we, we actually have it in the three questions. Where did you hear about us? The dad's group, the dad's group. There we go. There it is. Yeah. There are a few of us and I've, I've referred. So I, every time y'all have, have given a shout out on, well, who's sending folks from Reddit? I'm not, I'm like iffy on Reddit. But anytime I'm in there and somebody posts one of their progress pictures or they post something profound about their keto experience and they are obviously male, either by their pictures or by how they have identified verbally if they didn't post pictures, I have this little uh, kind of brief text file that I created in my text expander app that I drop in. Oh, by the you know, good job, whatever I want to say. And oh, by the way, if you're on Facebook, you should check out the Keto Man's Club. And I know there's one that I know, Larry Carl Owens, who has his own podcast, the No Breakfast Club, um, has joined. And I know there's a few others that I've kind of lost track of. But, you know, again, this is probably even I mean, our dad's group is a civil group, but that's because the dad men team, which is the nerdy name we call ourselves, uh, we moderate every post before it goes on, and we are like the live police force. Anytime we get complaints or reported posts for fear of having Facebook shut us down for people doing stupid stuff. So, yeah, got to say, I love this group, man. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's been but, an interesting experience finding this or making this group what it is. I mean, it's totally we have our own little private conversations off the group about things that pop up occasionally and whatnot, Chris, Alberto, some of the other admins and whatnot. And 98% of the time, we just can kind of sit back and like, yeah, let them just work it out themselves. You know, it's like a couple little kids, like they'll figure it out because they, if somebody gets stupid, then there's 3000 plus other guys who are like, uh, yeah, you're stupid <laughs> yeah. and they take care of it. So it's been fairly self-policing, which is very nice. Yeah. Yep, it has. Um, I've I've been admins of of other things, whether it be uh, multiplayer like clan type games or uh, like Ebony or, or all sorts of different things. And and uh, being the 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 admin for those is just heck. You know, it's just oh my gosh, you're having to babysit all these kids, uh, and that not the experience with this group and i love it so yes i i'm i'm right there with you on all of that um glad. i will throw one thing out that chris brought up a week or two ago privately um apparently there you know there's a few other kind of keto men groups on facebook and whatnot and chris found one and the admins are women yeah it, it, there's four admins for a relatively small group Two and two, two male, two female, and a couple of them had um, ketogenic uh, sponsored. Like I'm, a, I'm an advocate for you know, a, a, a uh, it, it was very clear that that it's very possible that that group could be or was a uh, just a salesy group, and those those are no good. And we we try really hard. You'll you'll notice that. If we have someone who who regularly contributes to the normal conversations, um, you'll see them post something of uh, that they're trying to promote from uh, one of the things that they're doing. We let that slide because they're an active part of our community. But if you're just posting or sharing something to hawk it or, you know, that type of thing, you will oftentimes either see them ignored and most everybody will just ignore them and, and it's not not a big deal. Or we will actually remove the post because we don't want the group to turn into some, you know, 
sell to me group uh, like it can potentially be. So that's uh, kind of the other thing that that kind of sometimes happens. So um, that's my yeah, that's that's where I am. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I love that about this group. One of the things when I first started doing keto and when I felt like I had my bearings and I started looking for groups, of course, you find all these keto beginner groups and, you know, a few of them were healthy and then others were you ask a question and uh, the the keto police was a term that I didn't know before, but wow, the keto <laughs> police would come out in force mm-hmm. or there was one that was, that I thought at least was particularly helpful. And I can't remember the name of it anymore because uh, I, I inadvertently got myself booted from the group for basically, you know, somebody would post uh, some spammy stuff or you'd ask a question. And one of the responses would be, check this link for this absolutely unrelated thing. And I would comment back, why are you spamming this post? This doesn't even relate. And, you know, I got booted from the group after that and was like, <laughs> oh, well, that's that's weird. But, you know, then I can't, I'm, try, I, I'm still trying to remember the timeline for how I found Keto Man's Club. If it was, I, I know that it's tied into to the, the former Two Keto Dudes podcast, uh, but I can't remember if I found you through them or them through you, but it was one or the <laughs> other. And gosh, I think with the exception of maybe a couple that I have forgotten, I, I am still a member of, I've dropped just about every other group. And and I do think I'm on at least one of those other keto man type groups uh, that has, and there's one other member who's also on my friends list who's in that group. And and yeah, I think they have at least one, if not two uh, women administrators, which you know, that's fine. It's just kind of weird, but mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh very interesting indeed. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in uh, a little bit to your health journey. Talk, talk to us about growing up. Um, what health was like up to the point of realizing that you needed to do something and what all of that looked like. Okay. So as far as I can remember, and one of the, if, if I were to make a map of all the, uh, all of the episodes of the podcast I've listened to, I think, or if I were to do one of those Wordle type things that, where you throw a bunch of text in and it creates a pictures of the words that are mentioned most, body dysmorphia comes to comes up a lot in these, and so I'm, I'll toss that out there right from the beginning because while I don't know that I would have been diagnosable uh, or have met the criteria for a diagnosis. I would say that, and I'm looking at this picture right now in my home office uh, for, that my mom and wife uh, put together on my 40th birthday that has all these pictures of me throughout the years. And from about the time I was in probably fifth or sixth grade, I've had this vision of myself being much bigger than I am. And I, I, I say that, and I was kind of chubby, but I, you know, looking at these pictures, you know, I wasn't all all that big, but I was kind of chubby. I'm looking at a senior picture or maybe that's a junior picture where I had kind of a double chin. But in my mind, I was a really big dude. Now, in high school, my oh, my junior year, I was I was up. I was at about 340. And then the summer between my junior and senior year, I got into lifeguarding kind of on accident and I had to swim every day and I dropped back down. I, I lost almost 100 pounds in like six months. Um, and then I thought, OK, I'm kind of normal. I went from like, you know, three whatever to two to down to 240 and uh, I'm six five. So I'm kind of a big dude anyway. In fact, that's one of my nicknames has been Big Dude, the other one, Big Khalil. And, you know, so. I, I've always pictured myself big. And then I got to college, uh, to community college, and I was still lifeguarding, and I was still kind of keeping my weight around 230 or so. And then I got to, went off to Eastern, moved across the state, and moved away from home. And I was, well, I couldn't find a, a lifeguard position over, over on this side of the state. The other thing that was different here, um, think back for those of you who are older to whatever minimum wage was when you were a senior in high school. And when I was a senior in high school, minimum wage for me was $3.35 an hour. As a lifeguard I made and a, and a swimming instructor, I made anywhere from $9 to $12 an hour. 
which, you know, it's not a lot. Well, actually, it's it's not it's not fifteen dollars an hour, but it's not, you know, like my kid can earn that money now doing work around the house or doing work for neighbors. But um, that was a lot back then. And when I moved to Spokane and was looking at jobs in the in the local pools, they all paid minimum wage or just a little more than minimum wage. And so I found a job that fit my schedule and I was a custodian on campus and, um, you know, I made a little more than minimum wage, had a decent schedule and I started to gain weight. And from like 1992 to, but I graduated in 96. When I graduated in 96, I was up to about 260 or 270. And in 97, I was in one of my best friend's weddings. And I remember being at the bachelor's party and one of the dads of, uh, or it might have been uh, his his fiance's uh, uncle, was thought I was bigger than I was. I was like, yeah, I'm just, you know, as long as I can stay away from 300. And he's like, oh, that's that was a long time ago, brother. And I was like, no, no, I'm I'm at like 270 or 280. Uh, at least I was at the last time I looked at a scale. And then next, you know, fast forward a few years, I'm done with college. I started working at the university. And in 1999, I got on the scale and I was like 372. And it was the highest that I had remembered ever being. And I was kind of mortified. So, it, but the, the weird part about it was I don't think I noticed. I mean, I had to notice because I bought new clothes that fit. I want to say 48 was my highest waist size. Um, I didn't really pay attention to the fact that I was getting fatter because I already thought I was fat. So here I am big, but I've always thought I was fat anyway. So all of a sudden, though, the scale is way higher than it's ever been. And I, and I start freaking out. So I started moving a little more again and started I did Weight Watchers and you name it between like 99 and about two years ago. I mean, I've done all these wonky diets. I've done these, you know, salt reduction diets. I've done Weight Watchers more times than I can think about. I tried Jenny Craig. I did the, um, oh, what's the shakes that you can buy at Shopco and Safeco and places, you know, uh, the little in, in aluminum, Slim Fast stuff. I mean, you name it. And I had tried it at some different point. And, you know, I was able to get myself down. So from 99 to 2000 or so, I went, I dropped down from the upper threes to, my bouncing place and my bouncing place was between 275 and 335. And so I kept a range of clothes that fit between those two sizes, got rid of the really big stuff. So I was down from like a, a 48 to a 44 and uh, two or three extra large talls uh, for my shirts. And, you know, and I just kind of rolled with it. Right. And Fast forward to I've been bouncing back and forth, um, you know, have kid one, then I have kid two and it, fast forward to 2018 and I'm probably sitting at about 330 and it's spring break of 2018 and I take my truck in to get the, the uh, tires rotated and I think I had to have the brakes done or something like that. And there's a little gas station across the street and I'm thinking, oh, I need I need some snacks. So I walk over to get a bottle of water and, you know, some some junk food to munch on. I can't even remember what it was, but it was either chips or, you know, peanuts or something. But I have my headphones on and I'm walking back to Les Schwab and I basically got taken out by a two and a half or three year old. Um, I have my headphones on. I'm listening to an audio book. I can't really hear what's going on around me. And this kid was running, being chased by his four or five year old brother, and he got me right behind the knees and I landed pretty hard on the cement and uh, thought I'd broken my hand. I was pretty bruised up. Uh, my wife at the time, my recollection and her recollection are different, but basically she's like, yeah, maybe you should lose some weight. And I'm like, yeah, I should probably lose some weight, but I, I didn't fall because I'm fat. I fell because I got tackled by a little kid and I didn't <laughs> see it coming and it was from behind. And she's like, yeah, but maybe if you weren't as heavy. And in my mind, what I heard is maybe if you weren't so fat, you wouldn't have fallen so hard. <laughs> but what she likely said was, well, maybe if you weren't so heavy, you might not have fallen or something along those lines. I'm sure it was more supportive than the inner monologue that I heard, but I heard it totally different than what she said. 
And maybe, you know, if you've had a significant other or somebody in your family who really cares about you, maybe maybe you've heard things that way, too, sometimes. Never. But I'm sure, you ever. know, it, yeah, it, yeah, exactly. So just as I'm healing from that fall, I'm cooking dinner up. We have a two story rancher and I'm cooking dinner and we had just had new carpet installed maybe a month or two before this. And I'm cutting onions or something. And my daughter, who was like nine or 10 at the time, lets out this blood curdling scream. And I go into oh crap mode and I go hauling butt down these stairs with new carpet on it. And I get almost to, and it's a the sta- it's one of those stairways that splits halfway and then goes the rest of the way down. <laughs> yeah. And I got almost da- to the bottom. And I slipped on this carpet and my right hand shot down to like catch myself. My left hand reached for a railing and I hit my hand. I thought I broke my hand. It, it, it hit so hard. I went in and got x-rays and there was no, nothing broken. But my the entire palm of my hand, particularly that fat part around my thumb, was black and blue. I could hardly move my fingers. It hurt so bad. And I was so swollen in the hand. And once again, you know, my wife... She tells me something, but what I hear is, if you weren't so fat, you wouldn't have fallen. <laughs> now, she didn't say it like that. She did not say it like that. Nor Those were not her words, but that was what I heard, right? Because of my own issues around being big and how I kind of tricked myself into thinking I was bigger than I was and kind of, you know, this like shame stuff that most of us guys who get big feel about our size. So... A few days later, and I probably said something flippant or defensive. And a few days later, she mentioned this radio pod or not podcast, but a radio commercial and a DJ on one of the radio stations that the the kids listen to quite a bit. It's a pop station. And she said, you know, have you heard these commercials? This DJ did this weight loss program and lost, you know, 50 pounds or something like that. And at that point, I, I've kind of backed down from my defensiveness and I'm, you know, thinking it through a little bit. And I think, OK, well, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe I should, you know, check this out. And I was listening to the radio with the kids and I heard the commercial and my oldest daughter was like, Papa, Papa, that's the commercial mom was talking about. So, you know, then that let me know, OK, so my wife and my kids are talking about how fat I am. This is great. <laughs> but... Um, you know, I, so I, I called the place, uh, and it, I, and to, to local folks and people who are in the States, but not necessarily here, there are, you know, when I, when somebody tells, asks me how they can lose weight or they tell me they want to lose weight, the two things I was like, there's the, the easy way and the hard way. And, and, and the hard way isn't actually that hard. The easy way is just a lot faster. And I went to this th- place called the Spokane Weight Loss Center, and they have a nine week program that's uh, limited, you know, a limited calorie and food type. Uh, the doctor that, that oversees it is all about uh, resetting your metabolism, decreasing inflammation. So it's like super low carbs, uh, very low fat, um, intermittent fasting and what they call nutraceuticals, which, you know, were various supplements that you take uh, throughout the day. And I did that. And I, in fact, I did it twice and I lost somewhere in the area of about 70 pounds. Um, and then one of the options that the doctor recommends once you've done, once you're done with the program so that you don't, you know, go back to being fat again, all he tells you, you know, we'll take your money again if you need to come back to us to lose more weight, but we don't want to have to do that. Uh, he recommended keto. So his his initial recommendation was, you know, buy all the, the blood testing equipment. And, and so it made it sound more, more complicated than it was to me at that point. And some of that, I think, was my own defensiveness kicking in. And it got me thinking, oh, wait, I've heard of keto before. So this was a little, a little over two years ago. Um, I had bought, oh, what was that book? I think, uh, oh, who's the, the guy that the... the the coffee, the keto, the keto coffee, bulletproof coffee, bulletproof oh, proof yeah. diet. Yeah. I bought uh, Dave, Dave's book. Um, I can't remember his last name after I'd heard him on some uh, tech podcasts. I think, I think I might've heard, heard him or heard about him on the Mac power users or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I bought that book and I start reading it. And the only thing that, that really stuck out as I, as I read that book with two things stuck uh, and that's bulletproof coffee sounds delicious and forget that that I can't do that diet. So I've lost all this weight though, and I'm done with this program. 
and I need something because I don't want to go back to what I've been. And I'm like, okay, let me look at this keto again. And so I start reading a bunch of books and I start, I think I hit Diet Doctor first, the Diet Doctor website. And that's probably my go-to website if somebody tells me that they're serious and they want to do keto. I don't talk to them about macros or about counting. I say, you know, go. And when I did the Diet Doctor, the, the, it's a little different now than it was when I did it. But they asked you some questions and you got a pseudo custom diet based on your preferences. And I followed that for like, I think it was two weeks. And then I did it for another two weeks. And then I started dipping my fingers into independent meal planning. And from there, I started counting, you know, counting my carbs and playing with macros. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd say probably for the first three or four months of being on keto, I was just following different meal plans and, and looking up keto recipes and kind of um, eating until I was full. And I stuck with intermittent fasting, which was a part of the Spokane weight loss program thing. And I continued to lose weight. I think I was at what, probably 240 or so when I stopped uh, my second round of the Spokane weight loss program. And I continued to lose weight. And when I hit a stall, I do something like, uh, you know, I go carnivore for a week um, or I would uh, play with my fasting hours. I mean, I remember as as Dr. Marksfeld, who oversees this weight loss program, would talk about keto. The more he talked about, it, the more I'd be like, oh, no, I ain't going to do that. Forget that. And then he'd go deeper and he'd start talking about like, I was already intermittent fasting, so that wasn't a thing, but he'd be like, and 24-hour fast and 48-hour fast and 72-hour fast. And I was like, yeah, this dude's crazy. <laughs> Not eat for two, three days? What the hell's wrong with him? I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have said that. No, but all, that's, you know, this, that's close enough this is like friendly. my mindset. <laughs> uh, and then I, I'm into keto and I'm playing with, with macros and I'm tracking and I'm tracking hard. And I thought, okay. Well, I didn't think I was going to do this, but I've been doing this for a while. So let's start playing with fasting. So I did a 24 hour fast and I was like, OK, this is easy. I did a 48 hour fast. OK, this is easy. Um, not uh, it was probably in the winter. I did a four day fast and was like, OK, this was easy. And I think I hit the uh, I, I probably did four and a half days and I, pro I might have even gone five. But my wife came back from a trip and we had a nice dinner. So. All of this stuff that I thought was impossible, I was like, I, I used to think these these keto folks are crazy, is now a part of my regular routine. And I'm loving it. Uh, I think the biggest thing, and I meld my weight loss experience with the program in with keto. Um, I do, you know, I probably could have done keto, but my mindset was so oppositional to it before I started losing weight. I tell folks that, you know, I look at that program that I did and I, I probably had to do that program to realize that I could lose weight. And in fact, when I when I, I went in for a consult with the program, they said, well, what you know, what do you weigh now and what are your goals? And I told them I was three something and, I you know, I'd like to be to like 260, maybe 250. And I thought that was the lowest I was ever going to be. And the uh, the lady that, that I did my interview with, intake interview, was like, oh, yeah, that's that's no problem. And I thought, OK, she's kind of crazy. And then I did the program and I dropped the weight. And then I thought, OK, well, keto, I did keto. I continued to lose weight. And now I'm sit. I, I bounce back and forth between about a, uh, 193 and 205. And those are kind of when I hit 205, I'm like 205. I'm like, OK, I got to dial it back in a little bit. And then when I get to 193, I get a little lazy and I don't track as hard. But um, one of my goals for this summer is actually to dial it back down and see if I can go to 185. I don't think I want to stay there. I'm actually pretty comfortable between, you know, in the 190s and the 205s. But just to see if I can, because, heck, I didn't think I'd be below 260. In fact, I remember thinking, ah. If I ever get below 240, I'm going to start getting my tattoos because I've been wanting tattoos, but I was afraid that, you know, if I got them when I was big and then lost weight, I was going to have all this weird saggy skin. And what would that do with all these tattoos that I thought I wanted? And, you know, I haven't had much. I mean, I've got a little saggy skin because I'm old uh, and I was fat for a long time, but, you know, I nowhere near what I thought I was going to have. And 
the the biggest thing in fact i was talking to a friend of mine now who is working on some weight loss stuff the the biggest thing like the weight loss was exciting and fun and you know i went from a, a size 42 or 44 waist down to a 32 or 34 i'm sorry i can fit in a 33 um but it's which I didn't even know they made 33s until I tried them on, but I'm, uh, they were a little <laughs> snug. So I've stuck with 34 and, you know, haven't tried on anything new since March. Uh, so I don't know if I could fit into a 32 yet or not. I know my, uh, my pants are a little loose right now. Uh, beyond bigger than the weight loss has been how I feel physically. So my mom retired uh, after being a school custodian for 20 plus years. My pops retired as a local haul truck driver for a, a national company. And one of the things that I remember, a hallmark of aging from the time they were in their early 30s on, was pain. And I thought, as I started having some of these pains, that this was just a part of getting old, suck it up, buttercup, because it don't get better. And, oh, man, I feel so good at 48. I mean, and, and just for, you know, for context, from probably somewhere in my early 30s until I was like 46 or 47, probably the second or third week on the, the Spokane Diet Program, I had what I call chronic morning pain where like my feet, ankles and lower back, I'd get out of bed and I hobbled for the first hour <laughs> and I had to stay moving because if I sat down, then it hurt for longer. So I'd get up and I'd walk around and I'd do chores and whatnot and putts around and do some dishes. And I hurt for that whole first hour. And, and usually it was before the rest of my family got up. And about the second week of not eating carbs and, and whatnot and really not eating processed food. I got out of bed and I could walk without doing the old man, the old man hokey pokey dance to the kitchen. And I thought, well, this is new. And it just continued as my diet got better. And that has continued with keto. And there are times where, you know, folks talk about cheating or, or, or going off plan. I, I, I don't buy into the cheating mentality with the exception of, I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit of like when I, uh, when I make a bad decision and eat crap, but, um, I, there are times where I will plan where it's like, okay, 4th of July is a good example, right? We, uh, had some company up to our like place for 4th of July and I had a couple beers and I had a uh, dessert thing that my wife made. And, you know, the rest of my food was within program, but those were the my off program things. Um, it happens and I go right back into it the next day and keto on. But um, some things really set me off. I love, love, love or I loved corn on the cob in the summertime, for example. And I had been off all these carbs for a long time and I had corn on the cob with my daughter. I took her from our place in, in outside of Spokane to the state fair where she was competing for, uh, I think it was a horsemanship or judging competition and then a public speaking competition. And after they did their thing, we got some, you know, we got fair food and I didn't eat much of the junk food, but I did have like two years of corn on the cob and about half of hers because she couldn't finish it. And I thought, okay, no big deal. The next morning, I get out of bed, I swung my feet to the ground, and I had to do the old man achy dance. Uh, just one day of eating, you know, two, year, two and a half years of corn on the cob, and that impacted me so bad that I'm off corn for good. So it, things like that, you really don't know how much you hurt until you wake up and you don't anymore. And, yeah, I can agree with know, that 100%. I, oh, man. And, you it's know, when, when I started this... This whole thing, it was like, you know, I thought my I thought my motivation was like, I don't want to be fat anymore and I don't want to fall down and have my family saying you're falling because you're fat or or that's what I'm hearing. That's not what they're saying. But once I start I stopped hurting, it became less about being fat and more about how I feel, right? How I feel physically, things I can do. I mean, I run now. It uh I started running kind of walk jogging a year ago, and now you know I can run. The most I've done so far is I've done I've done a little over 10k without stopping. But I, you know, I know I had more in me. I could have gone further. 
Uh, it's more like I stop because of time constraints. So one of these days, I'm going to have to see how far I can actually go before I have to stop. But I'm not fast by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, I never would have imagined doing that just a year ago. So, you know, a lot and I attribute a lot of that to to keto, to low carb, to avoiding, you know, crappy processed foods and to just being smart, smart and smarter about my health. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, and I've said it in the past, like when it comes to painting cars, like, you know, painting cars is ex- extremely physical. You're working on concrete. It, it's it's rough. It's rough on your joints, it's rough on everything. And, and one of the reasons when I actually started to decide to kind of back off and get into the service side of things was because I was having like almost debilitating knee and back pain. And I, like you said, I just thought it was it was getting older. You know, everybody hurts. Like Advil daily is going to be a normal thing because everything aches. Irony now is, you know, 10 years later. Those two two main reasons why I stopped painting, like I don't have any knee or back pain at all, and it's so it's just it's just amazing how when you give your body a chance that everything else, like you said, kind of is like a positive side effect, but the things you notice the most are kind of what keep you going. Yeah, I would have never guessed. I w- if you would have told me that you know you do this diet and you're gonna gonna feel so much better, not just feel better about yourself, because I think. One of the things that held me back from being successful in previous, you know, ways, I mean, certainly I think insulin had a lot to do to do with what held me back. But I think other attitudinal pieces was I didn't have the right why. Uh, my why was tied up in my own kind of self-image, my view, and it and it took me recognizing how good I felt for to really cement my why and and you know i mean of course i want to be healthy i want to be an active part of my kids lives i've watched a couple of friends uh you know and and i mean i was very drove home drove this home my health home for me a few years ago when a guy that you know and he was skinnier and always active uh but my age died the day after christmas of a heart attack while he was hunting in the woods and I'm thinking if 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 my friend Todd can die like this and, you know, he was a healthy, active guy. He wasn't, you know, he was he was kind of a, a I wouldn't say he was a health nut, but he was health conscious. Uh, he liked to have fun, but he was he limited his, you know, his alcohol. And to my knowledge, he never messed with other illicit substances. So it's like if he can die in the woods of a heart attack and he's healthy, what the heck is going to happen to me? And, yeah. you, but again, you think that, and, but it took until I realized, oh crap, I don't hurt anymore for my why to kind of be a little more cemented in my head. So talking about, there's so much to take in. You, you're, you've done awesome. I want to go back a little bit. You're growing up and everything. You talked about um, your weight issues and things like that. Were you, was that typical for your family? Not really. Yeah, I would say that you know my mom has uh, has. I mean, she's done different diet stuff for probably as long as I can remember. But you know, you look at her and you wouldn't necessarily say, "Oh, that lady probably needs to go on a diet." Uh, I was probably the bigger one in my family, and and I was an aberration really. Uh, I wasn't a super athletic kid, which probably contributed to me being kind of chubby. And although I, I say that I was bigger, I, looking back at my pictures now, I wasn't insanely large, right? The, what, what tended to happen is the older I got, the bigger I got, but I thought I was big. I had two cousins that were skinny as rails, and they would kind of poke at me all the time for being a lot bigger than them. And I think I just kind of took that message in, and that just became how I saw myself over time. Right. So so when I did get big, it just it just evolved and it happened. And it wasn't a surprise because I already thought that I was I was big anyway. So, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah, my my family. No, there's not a lot of obesity that runs in my genetic family or in, you know, like my my uh, step, my uh, my my I've gotten on my stepdad's sister is a, a little big, but she's you know, earned all of her bigness, but she's, you know, again, I wouldn't say like morbidly obese or anything along those lines. So I was kind of the aberration as I got bigger because 
my family certainly proportionally they were nowhere near where I was. So along with that, then in in the successes that you've had in recent years with your physical size and weight and everything like that, tell me how your body dysmorphia has changed and modified. Do you still struggle with it? Where are you at with that now? You know, I think about it multiple times a week. Um, in part, I, I got rid of all my fat guy clothes for I held on to them for a while for fear that I was going back. And then I decided I ain't going back. Um, the, there are a few items of clothing that I have maintained because they have sentimental value to me. But there are some things that I do that I are carryovers from when I was much fatter, right? So when I think of things like, well, even there, when I say I was much fatter, I still have a little bit of girth. But, you know, when I reference myself as a fat guy with my friends who have never been fat, they look at me now like I'm crazy. And before when I was fat, they would look at me and, and you know, uh, sympathetically nod. So I still... It, it, I, I look in the mirror sometimes, and I've probably posted this in the group a few times. There was a picture I took about a year ago, in fact, fall of 2019, where I was walking out of the restroom at work, and I caught a profile view of myself, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, that's me now, and I'm not fat. And I, I have that picture. That's kind of one of my go-tos when I have to remind myself. But just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was with my family. We have a, a, a summer place that we spend a lot of weekends at, and we were doing some cleaning, and we were uh, we needed to check in the attic. And the access to the attic is really weird and awkward. And, you know, my wife was like, well, I'm going to look up there. You should look up there. And I'm like, I can't fit my head. The, I mean, I couldn't climb up there. Uh, it's just not big enough for me to get through physically or to get my entire body through. But I did not think my head and upper body would fit between the cabinet and into the opening the way that the position is. And my wife looks at me and she's like, are you sure you can't fit in there? And I'm adamant that I can't fit in there. And she's like, I think you can. I think you just don't think you can. And so I get up thinking I'm going to show her and I fit up there. <laughs> and it's things like that that happen all the time. And, you know, I'm still I, I didn't shrink in size. So I'm six five and I'm very conscious of the amount of physical space that I take up. And in part, you know, when I, I hate I used to hate flying on planes because not only are my knees in somebody else's back and they're probably going to recline into me anyway, but I was always spilling, you know, I would, I'm the guy who like sat with my elbows tucked into my stomach because I felt ashamed for spilling over into other people's seat areas. Right. Yeah. So I was super self-conscious about the amount of space I took up and I still am right. I still very much think about how much space I'm going to take up as I move around places. And it's only when I sit down somewhere that I realize, Oh, I don't take up that much space anymore. Or, oh, I guess I don't need to start with a two or three X. Um, I can, you know, XLT or large tall will probably do it for me just fine. So I, I would say that, you know, the, the body dysmorphia is still kind of present in, you know, in a lot of how I, I see and think think about myself. I don't always catch it, but I, I catch it several times a week still. Yeah, that's a weird one because I mean it, it kind of works both ways too. Because like I I had all my own my own health issues that I've I've talked about a lot, and like so for me it's the opposite. Like I always see myself as just that scrawny little kid, you know. Like in my head I'm just that skinny little like 140 pound kid that I was in high school, and it's like you said every once in a while like I'll get a picture where I can actually see like my size and, and, and I got to stare at it for a minute. Like, like, Holy crap. That's actually me now. Like, like I actually have like size. I have girth. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not as scrawny as, as the image in my head, like leads me to believe. And it, it's odd when it happens. And it's really weird when you catch yourself like in that moment. Well, yeah, the, the first, when I was doing my first weight loss program, uh, I, I had to go to the other side of the state. We had a, an aunt that passed away on Whidbey Island, which is about a six or seven hour drive from where I live. So my daughters and I went over for the memorial for, for Aunt Phyllis. And I there was it was a quick turnaround. I'd taken my youngest daughter to a ski camp in Oregon uh, a few days before this. So we got back and loaded up the car, repacked clothes and went to this uh, funeral with my older daughter. 
And I get there and we got there on a Friday afternoon. The memorial was Saturday and we were going to leave sometime midday Sunday. I get there Friday. We spend some time with the family. Saturday morning, I go and get a haircut. And then I come back and I'm getting dressed for the for the memorial. And I have my suit, right? What I At that point, I'd probably lost 25 or 30 pounds. But I put on this suit and it's like I borrowed a suit from my fat uncle. Yep. <laughs> right. I'm wearing this. I'm swimming in this suit. Yep. And I go to the memorial because it's all I, I don't have anything else that's appropriate for a memorial. I go to this memorial. I can't wear my dress belt because it won't hold my pants up. The, I don't. And I didn't bring my leather punch or a drill with me to put new holes in it. Uh, I have my my old I have this leather belt that I've had through a bunch of incarnations of being fat that I've drilled multiple new holes in. So it's got like a foot and a half of leather you know, now, and I, I, br- I have to wear that because otherwise my pants are going to fall down. My jacket looks like, again, it's my fat uncle's jacket. And I arrive at, at the, the church where the memorial is. And uh, one, one of my cousins looks at me and she's like, oh, you've got to get some new clothes. <laughs> and she, she's the one who gave me the fat uncle. She's like, you look like you borrowed that from your fat uncle. And, you know, at that point, I was like, oh, I wouldn't have thought about that beforehand. And even now, you know, I throw on a shirt that's like I I don't always think about it when I put on some of the shirts that I still like from when I was much bigger. And I'll walk out. My wife will be like, "Um, you're not going to wear that anywhere, are you? Well, I was going to. She's like, yeah, that's a little big. And I look down and like the the shoulder seam is almost to my elbow or something like that. And it's like, oh, yeah, I, I guess I should change. So yeah, it's a weird, it's a really weird thing, and it and even now, you know the the approach that the approach that people have, like we were at a before the COVID hit, we were at a, a fundraiser for my daughter's ski team, and I'm sitting with one of the the other ski team dads, and we were talking, and we were talking about weight loss and stuff, and I was like, yeah, when I was fat, and he's like, wait a minute, and I've known him about a year, maybe a year and a half, and he's like you were fat. And I pull out my phone and I show some pictures. He's like, Oh my gosh, I never would have imagined you being that big. I've just known you as, as this guy is like skinny Khalil. And I don't think of myself as skinny Khalil. I think of myself as big <laughs> Khalil in every sense of the word. Yeah. Big as in round, big as in tall, big as in personality sometimes. And to have somebody tell me they just thought about me as skinny. Cause that's the, they've known me in this little part of my life is like, wow, that's something else. And meanwhile, some of my friends who have watched me shrink, if you will, you know, we'll, we'll be talking. One of the guys I ride motorcycle with, uh, he's, he's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, you were, you were pretty much going to get the diabetes. I'm like, nah, my blood sugar has been okay. He's like, nope, you were bound for diabetes. And I'm like, wow. Y'all didn't y'all didn't tell me that when I was fat though. Why you got to tell me that when I'm skinny? <laughs> you yeah. should have told it to me when I was fat. That's when I needed to hear it. But it is what it is. And I get why people don't say it to you, you know? Well, and in in my experience, I don't necessarily believe that I was ready to hear it. I just like with you, you had to to experience this thing happen to you a couple different times where you fell or you lost your, your you, you you lost your balance or you felt out of control physically and like unable to be able to do what you knew you wanted and needed to be able to do and uh that that was a wake-up call for you I, I think that that for all of us we we have to get to the point where we're able to hear the message but i also think that um and I don't even know how they're supposed to do it, how we're supposed to do it for others, but there should be a way of approaching someone in love and saying, you know, I've been where you, you where you're at. I've experienced what you're experiencing. And I want you to know there's, a, there, there's hope. There's a way to improve. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, but how to do that? It, it, because if you talk about if there's two things that you stay away from in, in mixed company, it's religion and politics, right? Well, <laughs> diets are a very close second to those three or for those two, a, a very sec, a very close third. If you, you know, and people will will ask me, you know, uh, it, because it, it's evident or they'll, they'll have known me when I was larger and. I will relate. Yeah, I've I've lost quite a bit of weight using weight using keto, and you know, I, I try to keep it very very surface level because 
I just don't want to go there. I treat it with the same kid gloves that I, I would um, uninvited questions uh, about religion or, you know, about my poli- my political views. So uh, with that uh, rant and rabbit trail that I t- often do, uh, what has your family, your friends, what have their reactions been to seeing – uh, big Khalil turned into skinny Khalil and uh, what type of success stories have you seen come as kind of a domino effect? Well, so with that in mind, there are two members of our group that, that came in. I mean, and I refer anytime I, I hear like a dude um, and we're talking about keto and they know what they're talking about. I tell them, Hey, you, you got to check this out. But in the, I, I, I started my whole, in the summer uh, or in the spring, actually, of 2018. And I, at that time, I was sharing the, an office with a French instructor who had uh, at this at Spokane Falls Community College who had decided to take a different position for the fall. So there was a job search. I got this uh, great office mate, now uh, friend and colleague. His name is Eddie Kizaner. Uh, he's a Parisian French instructor at Spokane Falls. And he uh, he had the unfortunate timing or fortunate, I guess, because I think it's worked out to uh, as a positive for his health of being in the office as fall quarter started and people started coming around the office asking wow, what happened to you? You look great. How did you lose all that weight? And, you know, I have, I had this uh, monologue that I prepared by that time with, well, there's the fast way and the slow way. Both are great. I highly recommend both. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about both. And one was the Spokane Weight Loss Program, which I would not have been able to, I, I couldn't be here. I couldn't be in the health that I am without doing that and realizing that I can, in fact, lose weight and take control of my health. And then keto, which is an Enable me to continue to lose, to, to continue to feel wonderful, to continue to um, kind of own my own health. And so I and I've had people that I work that I work with who have said, OK, tell me more about this one and tell me more about this one. And, I, and I'm an evangelist for both pretty much. Um, and I can think of Eddie, who I mentioned, he uh, started doing keto with me and he'd bounce, I'd give him some resources and he'd bounce some questions off me and, you know, we'd feed off of each other, but he has been fairly successful uh, doing keto. And I want to say, I can't remember exactly. So Eddie, if you listen to this and I misrepresent your weight, I think he was like two, somewhere, I want to say between 250 and 230. I'm not sure where, but last time we talked about weight, he was just, I think he was like 212, uh, 212. Uh, maybe a little below, uh, and he was close to his goal and where he wanted to be. And, you know, this, this, and he felt great. And, you know, all of these things that we hear on just about every episode, the, the physical energy, the, the brain fog that kind of goes away or, or is decreased. The one thing I wish keto would do is give me my memory back, but I, you know, that, that, that's been long gone and maybe I'm just kind of crazy. But um, another one of our our members who I was just, in fact, the the text of the day, Nathaniel Neenhouse is uh, one of my cousins. He's the granddaughter of the aunt that passed away that I was at the funeral for. uh, He did the same program and then he shifted to keto. And his question of the day for me was, hey, do you do fat bombs? So we uh, had some dialogue earlier today about fat bombs, but he's been holding it steady. He was, I can't remember what he started. I think he was maybe a little over three and he's kind of riding at about 240, 245 and feeling good. And he's off of, I think all but one of his blood pressure medications, um, an absolute keto success. There are a couple of women that I work with out at the community college who have started doing keto, you know, and granted, I just, I, I point, point in a direction and I share some resources, a, a book here, a website there, uh, and a, as much positive and encouraging words as I can. And watching, you know, watching them take control of their health. I think Chris, I, I think it was Chris. I'm trying to match the voices with the, the identities. But, yeah, being able to find kind of a loving discourse about mm-hmm. making these changes for our own health is important. And being able to frame it. I mean, it's it's a lot easier for me to talk to people who knew me as Big Fat Khalil because I can frame it with, look, you know that you know how big I was. 
And, you know, I, I can frame it from where I was to where I am. And I tend to frame it less in it being about getting skinny and more in it being about not hurting. Because I can't tell you, there's not a single person in my circle that I've talked to about weight loss that, I mean, we all have some psychological trauma, but there's physical pain on a daily basis that, you know, is probably more tied to the food than the weight, but they work together in tandem. Yeah, there's a there's that running joke you, know, you had to have heard it before where they're, they're like saying like, you know, what's a tip of getting older? And then the response is, don't make any noise when you stand up. <laughs> <laughs> And that, you know, I, that that was kind of, if you would have asked me three years ago, much much like uh, if you asked me, like when I when I read, if I went back and read Bulletproof Diet again, I'd, I'd probably do a lot of the stuff and I'd say, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense. But, you know, three years ago, yeah, th- this dude's crazy. And if you would ask me, am I running, would I ever imagine myself, in fact, I thought running was for dumb people, you know, who needs to run? And even when I started losing weight, I, I lost over half of my weight without doing any physical exercise. I started physical exercise kind of to see what it like as an experiment. And then I realized, Oh, I can do this. So I'm gonna keep doing it. So, you know, I, I will say that I tried, I, I tried the couch to 5k several times between like 2001 and 2000 and probably 12 or 13. And every time I get to about week three of the couch to 5k program and I'd hurt one knee and it would put me out for three weeks and my motivation would be gone. Mm -hmm. Um, A a year into keto, I start running and wow, I I can even, wow, I don't have to stop. I can, I can slow down, but I don't have to stop. And now if I do hurt, I usually know why I hurt and it's not because I'm fat anymore. And it's, Certainly not because of my food anymore. So you actually had that type of thing happen, though, recently, and you kind of had to take a couple of days off. But in this case, it was just a couple of days off. Right. There, there have been two times where uh, the, the first time last year I had, uh, I, I didn't even know, there, you know, I still don't know all the names for all the muscles, but an IT band strain and I had to take a few days off for that. And then a little while ago, I I probably put a little, I did a 10 K and one of the things that I was noticing is if I vary my training days and I I was just kind of doing the same training every day. And if I varied my training days, I can increase my performance and, you know, watch my times go down. And so I did, I I'd done that and I did my 10 K and I ran my 10 K harder than I normally run my little five Ks during, you know, during a, a normal training routine and boy, I did hurt for a couple of days and I, and I had to take a couple of days off for that. And then more recently, I took a few days off more because uh, so my normal routine is to, you know, I get up before my family and I try to either run or get ready to run before everybody's up. Uh, but we were up the lake and we were all staying up a little later. So I just, you know, I wasn't feeling getting up at, at five, six, seven o'clock in the morning to go run. So I was sleeping in until everybody else did. So, um, but yeah, I, I had some, I had a knee and, and a little bit of hip pain. Uh, and, and that was, I'm pretty sure simply overtraining. And so I'm varying my training up a little bit now. Uh, in fact, I've got a schedule from one of our members that I, he emailed it to me and I hadn't had a chance to, to, play around with it. So I'm starting to play around with it to, with the goal of both improving my times by the end of the summer, I'd like to be right now. I'm somewhere between like, uh, consistently probably a a high 10 and, you know, mid 12 minute mile. And I'd like to get down to 10 minutes or less as my consistent mile, which again, it's not super fast, fast, but that's, that's, that's plenty fast, man. man. (laughs) You can sustain a 10 minute mile for more than a mile. That's fast. Like, even when I run 5Ks, my first mile is 10 minutes and it just gets worse from there. <laughs> but, but yeah, that, that's a good clip. Like, I have a very soft goal that I, I am not in any way, shape, or form trying to beat. But at some point, I want to run a 5K in under 20 minutes. And I, I got to definitely speed things up. You know, I got to be at just over six minutes a mile. And I like, like I said, it, it's a soft goal. It's something that I, I might try to shoot for eventually. Um, but. I'm not really training that hard for it right now because it's it's just not top of my priority list. And then another thing I got to try to do that I've never done is just one standing mile. Like how fast can I hit one standing mile? Because I've never just 
tried to run a mile. I mean, so the, the minimum now when I run, I got the perfect lap around, loop around my neighborhood that's exactly three, 3.2 miles, and that's what I usually do. And, then, you know, one of these days, I'm just going to have to warm up real good because I'm also getting old, stretch real good, and then uh, just, you know, walk, like, walk really quickly into the block, and as soon as I hit that stop sign, just take off and see how fast I can hit the one mile. See, and I should try that just to just to see what I do. It, my my normal routine, I, I've got this app on my iPhone where I've um, where I've plugged in these intervals, and so and and the it it's called the pro app is Intervals Pro, and it tells me what to do based on you know the the interval times I've given it, and it's either you know uh, moderate run or run faster, you fat effort, and. Uh, and it tells me what to do, and I don't have to pay attention. I put on usually it's you know a podcast or an audio book, and uh, and I just go, and it tells me when I need to go faster, and it tells me when I need to slow down. But um, I'm noticing that my my splits are getting a little bit faster every time I go, and that has been kind of impressive to me. But um, I've never just said, okay, let me just run a mile and see how long it takes me to do a mile. But half of my problem too is then I got to come back. Cause I live in the country and I just run, you know, I, I run and my, my timer tells me that I'm at the halfway or I've got a bunch of different time intervals, like how long I'm going to run for set up. And it tells me, okay, you're at the halfway point. And then I turn around and start heading back. So I think trying to do that with a mile would disrupt my time. I, I, I'd, I'd have to do it and then maybe plan on a slow jog back or something like that. Yeah, not a bad plan. Yeah, the only time that I've seriously tried to run was many years ago. At this point, um, my first first year of marriage, um, my best friend talked me into uh, running a a five k obstacle course uh, with him, and I tried couch to five k. I only had a few weeks, and I didn't train very consistently (laughs) and uh come race day it's quite literally record breaking day uh quite literally record breaking heat that day hottest day ever for that date and uh it had rained the the night before so the whole track was pretty much the mud pit not just the whole you know not just the parts that were supposed to be mud and (laughs) I'm still heavy. I'm not doing anything keto or healthy or anything like that. And it just, it was a wreck. I, I, my friend ran ahead because he's this tall, long legged guy. He made it through the whole thing. And about 45 minutes before I finally made it to the finish line, uh, he, he finished and, uh, he was about to reenter the course from the backside of it to come back and find me. Because I lost, it took so long to go through. Um, wow! That's the only uh, official race that I've ever done. That's the only official race I ever want to do. Uh, <laughs> so uh, maybe that'll change that sometime. Yeah. But not it, it, yeah. I it, thought about doing like a five or ten k just for the the bumper sticker bragging rights, mm-hmm. but then there's there's this other half of me. It's like okay, I, I run. I don't know that I like to run, but I like how I feel after but I don't necessarily like to run and I really don't want to run with other people. You know, in, in Spokane, we have this big blooms day. It's like a 10 K race that people come from all over the state and, you know, all over this side of the country to, to do. There's like 80,000 people that do this thing every spring. And now I don't know when they've put it off to because of the COVID, but um, you know, people are like, Oh, are you going to do blooms day? I'm like, Heck no, I ain't doing Bloomsday. That's like 80,000 people that I don't want to be around doing something that I don't really like to do, but I do because I like how I feel after. You know, why would I want to do that with people? But, you know, maybe if I can get a bumper sticker for one of the virtual runs, I'd be totally down. There you go. Hey, I ran a half marathon because of a belt buckle. Uh <laughs> the motivation is That's out there. From Texas. <laughs> yeah, some of those virtual See. some some of those virtual races, the uh the, the the medals that you get for them and stuff are pretty pretty cool. Um but I'm still not willing to to do it. <laughs> I'm I'm not. So uh one of our common questions as we wrap things up a little bit uh is that we ask for your favorite keto meal or food, with the exception of the very obvious steak. So what would be your go-to? 
So it is hard. One of the the mantras that I've picked up along the way, I've got kind of four that I that I kind of roll between. But one of the important lessons that I had to learn in all of this is food is fuel. And as much as I love good food, um, I, I'm also totally down with just eating what will work because, you know, it's going to get me through and it's going to be what I need. And, you know, just today I had I went to grab there was some ground beef in the fridge. I'm like, mm, I'm going I'm to I'm spice this up and make this for lunch. And my lunch was at like two o'clock and I grab it. And my wife says, yeah, I think the kids want to do something with that. I'm like, oh. Why do they get all the good stuff? <laughs> but I grabbed a couple of uh, these um, kind of paleo Sabino sausage things that I get at Costco, um, half of an avocado. Uh, I threw a little salsa on it and put uh, one of those, those, I melted a folio cheese thing over the top of it. And that was lunch. But, you know, I can, I can range from, you know, I love ground beef for just about anything, but I'm pretty dig on flexible. You know, I will throw together anything that fits in in the program. Um, you know, fr- sometimes it's you know straight up just meat. Sometimes it's sausage. I eat a lot of eggs, so you know I'm, I'm certainly not a gourmet, but I like to play with my food. And some of my combinations end up being a little weird, but then I have to eat them anyway. Fair enough. Fair enough. So. Um... How can people connect with you online if they want to ask questions, get more information, um, just connect with you in general? So I'm I'm in the group. Uh, I believe my keto, or not my keto, but my big my uh, Facebook is uh, is Big Khalil. If you search for Big Khalil, you should and with two G's, B I G G Khalil. Uh, all one word. You should find me. I'm on Instagram and, and I'm big Khalil on Instagram too, but I can't remember if there's a period between big and Khalil or if it's all one word. Um, and those are the two I'm, I'm not super active on Instagram. I'm much more active on Facebook, but, uh, even that activity kind of wanes, right. Um, I think of, of, you know, as, as Berto was mentioning his, you know, deleting the app for a while, I haven't quite gotten there. But uh, I post very, you know, very little on my own aside from some memes and some every so often political commentary. But I've tried to cut back more on that. Um, but, you know, I'm active in, in the Keto Man's Club. I'm active in a bunch of dads. And the Spokane Weight Loss has a private group that I'm still active in there where I give feedback and, and support to other people who are doing what I did when I started my weight loss journey. Um, those are the places where I make the most significant contribution. I still, and probably it's because I'm old, that whole, like, what do you use Instagram for and snap porn? I mean, Snapchat and Facebook, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. I tell my students, I'm, I'm very certain that the only purpose one has a Snapchat is they want to share illicit photos of themselves with, with people in hopes that those pictures will disappear. And I also <laughs> tell them, don't do it. But, yeah, that's you know, good advice. I don't think they hear me on that. Yeah, that's that's good advice for sure. Okay, very good. <laughs> well, um, with our, our new routine, uh, you can go to our website for all of our social links for the podcast, our website, the Facebook groups, everything. That website is theketomansclub.com. And you can get a hold of us a couple other ways that may not be on the uh on the website. Now, there is one other piece of business that I need to mention before I let go of this. And I don't know how long this will be. Uh, so jump on it now while you can. KetoCon has very graciously offered us a uh, 15% discount code for our listeners and for our, um, for our uh, page, um, our, our page members, uh, that, that you can go to ketocon.org. And then do Keto Man 15, Keto Man 15. And I'll have that in the show notes so that you, you can see it and, and whatnot. But it, that will take 15% off. And right now, it's on sale. So it's only $99. And so it, it will be less than $100. It'll be 15% off that $99. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's, for, that's to have access to all the digital presentations yes. since yes. obviously nobody was uh, – able to do it live because yep. there was no live. 
and the most important one in there is mine. So yes, you can pay yes. seventy five bucks for mine. Yep, ex- ex- exactly, <laughs> exactly. Actually, I guess it would be eighty five. I can't even do math. It is eighty five. <laughs> it is eighty five. But it, the, the uh, go ahead and check that out. Jump on it now before that cha- that pricing changes. The the normal price for that, I believe, is one fifty or more. Um, so um, that that is uh, kind of um, something that that I before I forget. Uh, and then I will try to put a link. Uh, well, actually, there is a KetoCon link already on the, the website, theketomansclub.com, and that will uh, cross you over to there. Um, and then we also have our email address. You can email us at ketomansclubpodcast at gmail.com. And you can leave us a voicemail at 512-518-6161. So you've got a lot of different ways to connect with us on social media, on the groups. Uh, so check check that out. Connect with us. Uh, tag us on a post if you need to. Uh, whatever it is, uh, go ahead and and uh, reach out. We'd love to hear from you. So um, any other closing arguments or anything? I think we're good, man. I got no argument All in me. Good. Okay, well, that's uh, then that's it uh, for this week. Until next week, make sure to eat meat, lift heavy, sleep, and repeat. Thank you for joining us for the Keto Man's Club podcast. Your support means the world to us. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Would you help us spread the word about the Keto Man's Club by sharing with your friends and family? We're available on all podcast platforms, so just search for Keto Man's Club and you'll find us. If you would like to connect with us, you can do so a number of ways. Our web address leads to our Facebook group, theketomansclub.com. That's T H E K E T O. M-A-N-S-C-L-U-B dot com. You can also follow us on Instagram at Keto Man's Club Podcast. Lastly, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to reach out via email to Keto Man's Club Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to hanging out with you again next week.